essentially what was an open air prison for them for their entire lives. And because of them trying to make an effort to escape such a prison, they were met with bombardment and constant bombing to the point where people are dying in the hundreds every single day. A population of 2.2 million people where half of them are children. And that's just something, not even as a Palestinian, but as a Muslim, that should break your heart. Because as a Muslim, we all know we're one Ummah. 
And when one part of the ummah is hurting, all of us are hurting. And so today we're just gathered here today to have a brief talk, just to shed light on the situation and to make dua for our brothers and sisters in Palestine and in Gaza, inshallah. So the first part of, um, of our talk today is just going to be an Islamic background by Mufti Sultan. And what we should do as Muslims when we see uh, atrocities and oppressions like this happening across the world. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah. Wa salatu wa salamu ala Rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa man wala amma ba'd. قال الله تبارك وتعالى في كتابه العزيز بعد أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ألم ترى كيف فعل ربك بأصحاب الفيل صدق الله العلي العظيم My dear respected brothers and sisters in Islam الحمد لله جزاك الله خير فرسي أنس for that wonderful introduction of this program May Allah Azza wa Jal make it easy. He's mashallah Palestini himself. May Allah Azza wa Jal make it easy for all of our brothers and sisters from that part of the world to, to process anything that happens tonight or for the foreseeable future, however long. May Allah Azza wa Jal just really make it easy on our hearts. Um, I want to start with what I'm going to talk about so that inshallah we can benefit from this program. There's, I just came from a protest. There's an effort taking place there. There is right now simultaneously, there's a fundraiser happening, which is also extremely essential, and there's people there. I also wanted to make sure, because I was invited to that fundraiser, I wanted to, I, in my heart, I'm there, but I also wanted to make sure that there's something that takes place here as well. That every religious institution, every house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has one house of Allah in mind right now, and that is Masjid al-Aqsa. So that's my purpose of, inshallah, holding this program. So to gather as many people as that we possibly can, to help with our aid. You know, people are sending all kinds of things to aid their people. Okay, I'm gonna be very sometimes ambiguous to try, I'm gonna try my best to be as ambiguous as possible. You know what I'm saying? Because I don't even like saying the names, I don't even like giving names to people who do things like this. You get what I'm saying? Like, they get all their aid from this country, from that country. We get our aid from this. We get our aid from this. So inshallah, this is what our part is. And that's why I want to start off by mentioning what part of this three-part program we have organized for us today. We have the Islamic portion. The Islamic portion is, I'm going to talk about, because again, I, I, this is what I deal with, this is my functionality of this, to explain Islamically how we respond as Muslims according to the teachings laid out by the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam when we see stuff like this because the emotions really run wild. We really don't know what to do because our brain is just infested with so many different things going on right now. When we need direction, when our emotions again like are just running all over the place, we get direction from Allah and His Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So that's inshallah going to be my portion of it, inshallah. So a general, how should a Muslim react to atrocities like this? Thereafter, we're going to have Brother Anas speak, inshallah. We're kind of back and forthing with the MC because we don't have the MC. We have three speakers, but we're all each other's MCs, okay? So Brother Anas right here, excellent job of introducing me. I'm going to introduce his part right now, and that is he's going to speak about from the perspective of a Palestini, he'd like for all of us to understand that it's not a Palestini issue. That is an issue of every ummah. And we really need, as all segments of the Ummah, to hear from a Palestini that this is not a Palestini issue, it is an Ummah issue, it's a Iqidah issue, it's an Iman issue, it's a simple mercy, decency, human decency issue. Okay? So that's inshallah going to be that segment. And then thereafter, when we do, okay, now we got to do stuff, what do we do? Do we just go do whatever comes to our head? <laughs> and how the Prophet says, I'm apply the seerah in his time, yes. It was beautiful how we applied in this time. How can we now take that and apply it in our time? That's Brother Wilfredo's job, inshallah. So that's the purpose of this three-layer program that we have laid out. And then we're all human beings at the end of the day. No matter how well we lay out a program, this is an emergency situation. We just put this together. Allah is the one who we pray to at the end of the day. After our Salat of Aisha, we're going to make a group du'a, inshallah. So that's, inshallah, the purpose, the agenda of this, this program. Let's get it started, inshallah, with a prophetic response. 
I'm feeling all kinds of emotions right now, right? Like I feel, you know, subhanAllah, uh, anger, frustration, all these things. And we had a discussion when I did uh, my, my weekly halaqa at the college at Nova. I had a discussion with the students just to kind of see what people are feeling, right? There was a handful of them. If we do that here, we're not going to get through the lecture. But back then, it was possible. So I asked everybody, and these are the types of things that I was hearing. And I concurred with all of them. I was feeling the same things. Frustration, anger, confusion, sometimes a little bit of paranoia, like what's going to happen to our people? What's going to happen to our town? What's going to happen to our masjid? So a lot of things put together. Right? Now, how am I going to express these jumbled emotions into some efficient, strategic attempt at changing what Allah asks me to change in order to rectify any situation that needs a change. Right? And that principle is very broad and applies to every situation that needs to change. It's a situation that we all agree needs to change. How it needs to change? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala teaches us initially with the, in the beginning the principles of change. Allah says, إِنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يغير. Allah will never change what has befallen a nation. Or in our case, a segment of our nation, a segment of our ummah. Hatta until you people change the condition of that which has become of themselves. So that's a principle of change that Allah elucidates in the Quran very vivid. What then do I now need to change? What do I need to know differently? What do I need to do differently that serves as an active action plan from my end to change this very, very terrible, terrible situations? Because one thing that I also want to elucidate as a principle is we're, what we're not allowed to feel. What we're not allowed to feel is defeat. Allah says, وَلَا تَهِينُ Do not feel defeated. And Allah said this after the Prophet ﷺ lost his teeth. The Prophet ﷺ lost his uncle. He saw mutilations of bodies, like we're seeing mutilations. The Prophet ﷺ saw all of that. What? In the Battle of Uhud. The Battle of Uhud. Right after the Battle of Uhud, Allah talks about everything that went down. Allah talks about you know, corrections. Allah talks about what went wrong, what could be fixed. And then he says at the end of it, Wala tahinu. Don't you dare feel low. Don't you dare feel belittled. Don't you f dare feel down on yourself. That's what we're not allowed to do. So when you're not feeling down upon yourself, what you're doing is you're assertively trying to make what Allah says in the first principle that we talked about, a change. What now needs to change? Now, there's so many things that come to mind. I'm gonna use the random thing that pops in my head right now because I'm coming from a chant, okay? Chant, when I hear, because we're chanting, you know, uh, for Gaza, Gaza, don't you cry, Palestine will never die. You feel the chant, and then you think back in our seerah, in the life of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu when did he chant, and what did he say? He did chant. His chant was when he was again fighting against tyranny and oppression. What was his chant? His chant was, I am a prophet and there's no lie in that. I am the son of Abdul Muttalib. He's proud of being a grandson of his grandfather, Abdul Muttalib. So then, it took me to Abdul Muttalib. The Prophet is going around defending justice, going around eradicating tyranny, yelling Abdul Muttalib as a chant. What did Abdul Muttalib do that's so special that getting the Prophet to say his name? Abdul Muttalib, we don't learn a lot of tafsir from him. You don't learn a lot of hadith from him. You don't learn a lot of fiqh from him. You don't learn a lot of these things from him. But Abdul Muttalib, what do you learn from him? You learn from him. Why did I recite? Because uh, uh, you might have heard, thought maybe he's going to come read Subhanallah the Asra bi Abdi. He's going to come read a verse that talks about Masjid al Aqsa. Why did I choose to read Alam Tara Kayfa Fa'ala Rabbuka bi Ashab al Feed? Did you not see what your Lord did to the people of the elephants? Is because Abdul Muttalib came to mind. What do we learn from Abdul Muttalib? The principle of defending the house of Allah. Aqsa is one of the greatest houses of Allah, and even greater of a house of Allah is Baytullah itself, Ka'bah. So if there's any principle to be learned in defending the house of Allah, you learn from someone who did it in a way that Allah talks about it in the Quran, and we all recite about it every single day. Abdul Muttalib realized he's going to be facing an army that he can't deal with. 
right? We, do we feel some, some sort of similar ways? Abdul Muttalib feels like this army, Abraha, is coming together with things that I've never even seen before. Like when Arabs saw elephants, they were like, bro, what are those? And then they named the whole year the year of the elephant because they're like, we've never seen this before. So this year must be called the year of the elephant, right? So Abdul Muttalib has seen things now or heard of things that he's never ever seen. He doesn't know what to do about them and he doesn't even know if he had, he knows for sure he doesn't have the strength, but he doesn't know what comes next. He doesn't know. Abdul Muttalib, what does he decide? He says, well, I still need to do something. They've come close. Abraha's army had come very, very close from Yemen. They pillaged all their way from the south and they made it to the Kaaba. Now they're on the outskirts. Now, as they're on the outskirts, they haven't laid full siege, right? It's still in the beginning stages of war where they're committing atrocities. They're killing people, they're pillaging, they're destroying things, they're stealing. Abdul Muttalib walks around his army and he looks for things that he can do to help. And someone complains to him that, hey, look, someone stole from me 200 camels from Abraha's soldiers. These soldiers committed an atrocity to me. So all, the, all the killing, the, the mutilation, all of the things, someone complained to him about camels that were stolen. Abdul Muttalib said, well, this is one thing that I can do. I'm a leader, he's a leader, I'll go talk to him as a leader about your camels. So he pulls up to Abraha's court and his goal is to get back the camels. When he gets there, Abraha, when he sees Abdul Muttalib, his stat, like, like the, the way he, he presented himself whenever he went in front of royalty, it was a breathtaking entry. It was just, oh my God, someone of value has just entered. Just his presence caught Abraha's attention and he sat upright, right? Thinking, you know what, I'm going to give this guy some respect because, well, he's a leader. Abdul Muttalib, you know, appears before him and Abraha says, oh, welcome. What is it that I can help you with? What is Abraha expecting to hear? He knows that Abdul Muttalib knows that he's here to destroy the Kaaba that he's in charge of with an army of elephants. He knows all of that. So he's expecting now to hear from Abdul Muttalib's voice, uh, uh, mouth, please do something about this situation. Please don't destroy our Kaaba. That's what he's expecting to hear. You know what I'm saying? Please end this whole thing. Stop the whole thing. No. You know, that's what he's expecting to hear. But what Abraha hears is... Hey, uh, yes, so my concern is that there's 200 camels that were unjustly usurped by your soldiers who committed that absolutely unjust act upon one of my innocent shepherds or in innocent camel grazers. I'd like them back. Abraha lost all respect in that moment. He's just, really? You're as shepherdly as they say. Why are you here talking to me about camels? When there's an army of elephants waiting to raise your whole city to the ground. Abraha said, the one thing that I built this whole thing up for principle. Inni ana rabbul ibn. I'm in charge of these camels. I came to you as a representative on behalf of these camels. Wa anna lil bayt, the Kaaba that we're speaking of, it also has rabban, it has a lord. Say yakfi, he'll take care of that. I can't do that, that's beyond my control. What is in my control, I'm not going to stop doing that just because I know we're going to be destroyed anyway, so forget about these camels. What are you going to do with these camels when they come and destroy them with elephants? You know what I'm saying? What are your, your, your camels going to fight these elephants? Like again, there could be so many... What do we do in times like this as an ummah? We become sarcastic with each other. We start mocking each other's efforts. We start looking at each other's efforts and saying, ah, oh, you, you're not doing nothing, or you're doing too much, or you're corny, or you're too much, or you, you're going to get in trouble. We do all of this, we do all this mocking. And what did the Prophet Muhammad's great companion, Umar bin Khattab, say when he took Jerusalem, actually? When he actually took Jerusalem, what did he say? Why are we so disgraced? Why is it such that this tiny little strip of land, this open air prison, is sandwiched between literally majestic Muslim wealth, power, control, oil, all of that. 
And we can't help this cry of a child who's being burned alive. Why are we so disgraced? Umar bin Khattab spelled it out for us when he took the keys of Jerusalem. How ironic. He says, because we're going to look for this honor, this izza, this lack of disgrace in other avenues, at other doors. We're looking elsewhere for honor. We're looking to say how we can be you know, uh, friends with people. How we can get society to accept us. How we can assimilate within this culture and be just like these people who turn their backs on us when our children are being slaughtered. How can we be just like them? How can we look like them, talk like them, walk like them, party like them, do all of these things just like them, and then when they turn on us and we're like, oh, why y'all just... <coughs> Which, in essence, Umar bin Khattab already told us what went wrong. Allah won't change our circumstances until we change ourselves. What is our job? Our job is to see what can I as a person do as an ummati of the Prophet to change my behavior when I go to my Lord? What do I need to cut out from? How am I praying for Gaza and then doing something haram on the side? You know what I'm saying? Like It's not going to change. No matter what we do, if our prayers are not powerful, our weapons will have no might. But if our prayers are powerful, our iman is solid, Allah took care of al-feel. Allah says, Alam tara kayfa fa'ala rabbuka bi ashab al-feel. Did you not see what Allah did to those elephants and those companions of those elephants? Alam yaja'al kaydahum fi tadleel. All of their plotting and planning, Abraha had plotted for so long to do that. He didn't even have elephants. He hired an elephant breeder. Right? He made, Allah says, do you not see they're plotting and planning and recruiting this ally and decreeing? Allah says, all of their, Allah says, did I not destroy it all at the end of the day? Tarmihim. No. وَأَرْسَلَ عَلَيْهِمْ طَيْرًا أَبَابِينَ And I didn't even use other tanks to do it. Or other elephants. I didn't send my lions upon those elephants. I used my tiny little birds. And then what did I do? Did those birds carry some acid or some crazy? No. Rocks. Bihijara. What's in the hands of those innocent little children? Hijara. Tiny little rocks. When, you're, when your rocks have iman, they will take down the elephantine, whatever it is they throw at you. But when our, our du'as, which the Prophet says the real weapon of a Muslim is a du'a of silaq al mu'min. Prayer is the weapon of a believer. If our prayer is not going anywhere because of our sins, then subhanAllah, it's nothing that we ever think of and strategize with is ever going to work. Which is why, inshaAllah, individually, we all must believe I can change the circumstance of Jerusalem by changing myself and making a strong, solid dua to Allah. My dua, my one dua, my one tear in the court of Allah could change the whole entire situation until you, every single one of the ummatis of Muhammad Rasulullah does not start believing that, ain't nothing going to change. So inshallah, I want us all to walk away from here uplifted. It breaks our heart. We are heartbroken. No problem. Let's cry. Every time we see that, let's cry. No problem. Because that is our child at the end of the day. As soon as we wipe our tears, hold those hands up. Say, Allah. They, got, they think they got power, but we have real power. We have you. You say Allah like that, you think Allah is going to reject it. No. I, I end with this. I took too much time. There has, still has to be Brother Wilfredo and Brother Anas speaking. What I am going to end with is I was reading the story of one random janissary, right? Or he, he wasn't even a janissary janissary. He was a Levant. What, are, what is that? For those of us who are not familiar, in the Ottoman Empire, which was the longest lasting empire the Muslims had, okay? Their core was called the janissaries. And then they had their naval corps that their admirals had under them on the sea called Levents. And these Levents were, again, is everything okay? Yeah, okay, it's kids, they're, they're gonna do what they do, that's all. So these Levents, they were the head defenders of the naval admiral. So one of these Levents, he was captured, and he was having a con conversation with his executioner, right? His executioner was like really mocking him and torturing him and throwing boiling water on him, plucking his nails, all the kind of stuff, whatever, right? Torture. He was doing all that stuff to him. The Levant was taking it all with such grace until the guy who was torturing him was really tired of it. He was like, well, dude, like, 
okay, I'm gonna kill you now, I'm tired, but do you want anything? I feel kind of bad now, like I'm done toying with you, but because I feel bad, I wanna let you do whatever you want, you get one last wish. He said, just let me pray to the gods. He's like, how are you saying it that chipper? <laughs> You know what I'm saying? Like, how are you saying it with that much happiness? Like, just let me do the let you have got some, like, as if, like, you're just going to take a business trip. You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah, just give me, go pray real quick. He said something so profound, man. I don't even know what is this guy's name. It was just written down as a random Levent defending uh, uh, the Admiral Khairuddin Rais, who was Sultan Suleiman Qanuni's admiral who conquered all of those islands for the Ottoman Empire. Right? So again, we know the name of the guy who was working for him. We don't even know this guy's name, but I know his iman. What did he say? He said, I'm comfortable because, wallahi, I don't think I can remember I, the last time I did anything haram. I never disobeyed Allah. Intentionally, not that I can remember of, I can remember of any instant when I did anything haram. So what do I have to fear? I'm just going to pray one time and I'm going to go to Allah. That, he, he became Muslim instantaneously. Right? But subhanAllah, that, that answer right there is how many of us can say that? We, we make all these big claims, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that. But how, can, how many of us can say that I've respected Allah so much that I've shied away, I've been bashful every time I thought, my, a thought crossed my mind of doing something to cross my maker? We, there's a lot, a lot of us who can say that. And that's what I'm saying. Our job starts there. Our start, we can't do a lot in terms of we, we, our hands are tied. But not from doing this. Right? So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give me and all of us the ability to really have passion and hope and yaqeen and certainty when we pray to Allah for success. And the hadith that I close with is Pray to Allah when you really believe that He's going to answer you. Pray to Allah knowing that He is going to open the doors. Sultan for that beautiful talk about the Islamic aspect of what we should do um, in regards to the situation. Um, for me, I just want to talk about personal experiences that I've had over in the region and experiences that people close to me have had. Just so that you guys understand why what is happening is happening and the reasons behind the, the problems in the land. First off, I want to start by speaking about the conditions. I'm just going to put it on. So continuing, I just wanted to start by speaking about the conditions that actually occurred in the region. Um, a lot of you guys might not know, but you hear it on the news, the word apartheid. But what that word actually means is that two different groups of people are treated differently based on rape, race, or ethnicity. And a lot of the time, the media tries to claim that Israel is not an apartheid state. But because of what I've seen, because of what I've personally experienced, I can tell you for certain this isn't true. The first example that I can point to up until recently <coughs> We weren't allowed to travel in the same airports as an Israeli citizen. We had to cross into a different country and take a bus in order to get into our own country. And then even with all that, we weren't allowed in a majority of the country. Up until recently, we couldn't enter the Masjid al-Aqsa. We could not enter Jerusalem, and we couldn't go to any of the coastline. The only reason that recently American citizens of Palestine have been able to get into these lands is because the Israeli government wants their people to be able to come into America without visas. So this summer they started a program where you were able to apply for a 90-day visa as an American citizen, but only the American citizens. But even with that, they still discriminated against the people there. One instance that I can think of off the top of my head was one, one day, me and my family, we had wanted to go pray Salat Lasha in Masjid Al-Aqsa. 
So we thought we had visas so we could just go into a bus and cross through the checkpoint. And when we entered the bus, we thought everything was fine until we got to the checkpoint. The soldier gets on the bus and he asks us for our hawiyas, which is your citizenship as a Palestinian. We handed him the hawiyas and we also gave him the visas, which should have granted us access through that checkpoint. After around 10 minutes of him looking through all our stuff, he comes back and he says, you can't go through the bus, you have to walk through the checkpoint. So a family of seven now gets off a bus and walks into the middle of the street through traffic just to cross around into a checkpoint. And that's only because we were a different race than them. Next, I wanted to talk about the actual living conditions of the people there. Your water and your electricity every single week is cut off. You only have running water, if you're lucky, for three days of the week. And I'm talking about where I'm from is one of the most advanced cities in the whole region, Ramallah. We still don't have access to water. Most of the week, we don't even have water running through the sink. We can't wash our clothes and there's no way to actually get water. But next, I wanted to focus on another important aspect, which is the healthcare infrastructure. And that's something that I was able to personally see this summer, considering that I had a surgery while I was over there. Um, I had appendicitis, so I had to get my appendix removed. And I had to go to a hospital over in Palestine this summer. And what I noticed is a lot of the staff is spread far too thin. Patients can't get care in time, and you have to share a room with multiple patients. So even if you are getting care, you're overcrowded, and the staff can't actually give you the care you need because they have to focus on multiple patients. And the doctors over there, they don't just work in one hospital. They're spread throughout all the hospitals in the city. So you might show up to the hospital and have to wait hours for the doctor to come, just like I did. But next, I wanted to talk about the judicial system. And that's one of the most unfair things that happens in the country. Because in almost 99% of cases, the, ju the judge over there, who is an Israeli, sides with the Jew. In fact, an example of this was just this summer. An Israeli settler who lives in an illegal settlement that is recognized as illegal by the United Nations killed someone in one of the, the villages in Ramallah. Within 24 hours, he was released. There was no due process of the law. There was no charges or conviction. He walked free when he put a man in his grave. And there was no one who could do anything about it. But next, I wanted to focus a little bit on settlements and settlers. And that's something that a lot of the world actually doesn't know. Because in land that is recognized as the state of Palestine, there is actually illegal Israeli settlements that occupy that land. So every single year that I've been going to Palestine, I've noticed a new settlement pops up with new settlers who do more violence to the people every single year. In fact, it's encouraged by the Israeli government and the Israeli army to go down from the settlements and attack the Palestinian people. In fact, they get protection from the military to do this. One example of this occurred this summer in a village called Turmus Aya. I had a friend who actually was there visiting from America, and he described it to me. His family had gone to the city to go shopping, and he had stayed alone at home because he'd recently had an oral procedure in his mouth to fix one of his teeth. So while he was home alone, 400 settlers come down from the nearby settlement, and they burned 30 homes in the village, killing one man, 27 years old, who left two children without a father and a woman without a husband. And all of this happened and nobody was held accountable. But the next thing that I wanted to share with you guys is actually a story from Gaza. And I know I'm not from Gaza, so I can't speak from personal experience. So I reached out to my cousin's wife, who's actually from Gaza, and she used to live over there for five years. And I asked her to just describe how it was living over there and it's very eye-opening hearing what she had to say. She lived in Gaza from 2006 to 2010. She said she witnessed two wars and was woken up one day to go to school, expecting to sit in a classroom 
as a second grader, only to find that her school that morning has been bombed, and she had no more school. So for the rest of the year, there was no school. There was no learning. And an entire population of children couldn't learn. But another thing that she said to me was that when she was in her apartment, she was at the balcony and she looked across to the supermarket and she noticed a man hiding in a corner. And she was confused. But only minutes later, that entire supermarket was bombed, killing everyone just to get to one man. And that's the justification that you will see on social media. They'll say, we killed 10 civilians, but we got the target. And at that point, it leaves you questioning the morality of them. But another story she mentioned to me was that the day before Eid al-Adha, she was watching a car drive by, and suddenly it gets bombed. And hours later, while they're looking at the wreckage, her father flips over a piece of the bomb. And on that bomb, it says, made in the USA. So you can see how this war was actually manufactured right here in America. And it got to the point where she described to me that five families were living in her home because all of them had lost their homes. And that's just what I wanted to talk to you guys about today. That yes, what's happening in Palestine is unjust and unhumane. But just because we're not all Palestinian, doesn't mean we can't feel for them. These people over there, they've spent their entire lives in a prison, their water, their food, their electricity being controlled. And while I usually don't try to speak about this subject because I know that there could be repercussions for me, and I've seen it happen to other people where they're put into interrogation for simple social media posts, for posts on Instagram, for simply talking about the country they're from. And it took a lot for me today to talk about this, but it's something that I felt was important and that everyone needed to say, to hear. And with that, um, I'm gonna end off. So, Jazakallah for listening to me. I'm gonna pass the mic to our brother Wilfredo from CARE, and he's going to explain the legal aspects on what we should do in this situation. I'm going to speak like for 10 minutes, 10-15 uh, minutes. I want to divide this talk in first an update of what's going on in our community. Uh, second, some of the things we are doing as community and and as an organization. Um, and third, talk a little about Gaza, about uh, how we are where we are right now, right? First, this particular international conflict is different, is perceived a little different here in South Florida as in New York because our broader community does have people who reside here and also reside in Israel. We also have thousands of families who reside here and reside in Palestine. So when I'm telling you this, I'm trying to bring to your attention the fact that this is a, a conflict that is that lands in the in our backyard, in our neighborhoods, affecting all the systems from the political system, academic system, law enforcement media, and I'm also bringing you this because precisely this is one of the 
situations where we need to be very informed and we need to be very measured in what we speak and what we say and how we say it. As a matter of fact, before this last war on Gaza, that is like the sixth war in the past 12, 15 years, it has provoked our families to really feel the sorrow of what is happening there because it's hitting very close to our houses or not close, is hitting in our own houses. And when I say that we need to be informed is because there is a thirst of our media perhaps to get somebody from our community that just to sometimes to, bad, to try to make the appearance that they are balancing their information and what they're conveying to us, right? I'm saying this because be even before all this class hour started, we were addressing a very important concern that involved our youth and law enforcement interacting with our youth law enforcement monitoring our youth and resulting in direct interventions with our families from law enforcement and our youth. We are being monitored, and this is not new, and I'm not saying this to fit any panic in any of us, but we are over scrutinized and over monitored for whatever we say publicly. And when I say whatever we say publicly, that includes our youth and what they even say in the chat of their video games. When we are thinking that we are being monitored in WhatsApp, in Facebook, we can say, of of course, we're being monitored there. But, but perhaps we lose sight that in any kind of public forum, we are being monitored. And our youth are being monitored. And the unfortunate reality of our society is that the son or a daughter of a representative can pose in front of the Christmas tree with an AR-15 rifle and a Merry Christmas and it's totally accepted and it does not raise any flags whatsoever in our law enforcement agencies. But just picture for a second any of our children in the day of week posing and posting in public media himself with any kind of weapon Say in Bovada or Nababuaba. So that unfortunate reality that the systemic racism of this in this our country still permeates all the institutions of this country where people of color, including us, are being treated systematically different and are being presented systematically different as the rest of the country. That's an unfortunate reality we need, to, we need to deal with. So we need to deal with that reality in a smart way. When we protest, think of this. Am I more useful protesting every week or do I really want to get arrested for not knowing what to do and not being well informed and not really projecting what our community really wants to communicate. That perhaps our first priority should be to claim for the life of a human being. That's our first priority. Nothing is more precious 
to us that any life of an innocent individual. It could be any individual, any innocent life for us Muslims is precious. Perhaps that makes us different from other people, but we are proudly different from other people. Let it that be. So, from before, these protests that are coming and will continue, our community was over-monitored and our youth specifically. You just can't imagine how this is going to progress in the following days and weeks and months. So we need to all of us and our families and our circles should be very well aware of whatever our children, our families, ourselves are posting and make it public. Another thing, and I have said this to some media, and obviously these are the parts that you don't see when I appear in the media. Our community is starting to experience some hints of what they experienced after September 11, in the sense that now we are expected to go to some kind of litmus test when we need, we need to publicly attest that we are for X country, or Y country, or Z country. And that litmus test that we are publicly being asked comes from the school district systems in their emails being sent to our families that we're dealing with that situation, to the higher education system as well, where universities are sending our students similar communications. Soon we expect from some employers as well to adopt that kind of policy to try to put our community in some kind of litmus test when we need to publicly attest our loyalty to any nation, when we only need to attest the loyalty to the nation, we are nationals of this nation. In the last three minutes, I want to land this a little in Gaza. Most of you, because perhaps our Palestinians, or have studied a little of Gaza and Palestine, are aware of the root cause of the problem. Why Gaza problem, quote unquote, wasn't solved in the second war that they have in Gaza? Or the third, perhaps the fourth, or the fifth? What makes them think that this sixth war on Gaza is going to bring any solution to the Palestinian Israel conflict? When I'm, an, when I'm asked in the media today, I was asked earlier today, what do, you, what do I foresee in the following days? I needed to tell them the truth. Based on our reality today, the state of Israel have access to open and close the tap water 2.1 million human beings receive. And we don't need to be a scientist or a doctor to know what happened to any human entity, animal or plant, when you deprive them of water. So what will happen to the lessons in a week is what happened to people who are deprived from food, water, and medicines in a week. And so on, so on, and so on, every minute every hour that happens in this situation constitutes a war crime. And I don't say this lightly when I say that this is a war crime. Our international community have agreed that in any war to impose collective punishments to the civilian population is a war crime. It's an act tantamount to a war crime. So our brothers and sisters in Gaza, what we are about to witness is perhaps
the first genocide of the 21st century when unfortunately thousands and thousands of our Gazans, children, elders, mothers, sisters, youngsters, and men are going to lose their life exclusively for their ethnicity because they are denied what we know in international law their inalienable rights. Inalienable means that no individual nor any state can take it from you. It's a right that comes with you by your human nature. It's a human right. One basic human right of all nations of the world, including the Palestinians, is for self-determination and their independence. To have a day when they celebrate their independence as Mexico celebrates it, as Canada celebrates it, as we celebrate it, Palestinians have an inalienable right to celebrate their independence one day. No human being, no country, no institution can take that human right from the Palestinians. The same as our recognition as Palestine as a holy place for us, no matter whatever political decisions are made in the world, Palestine, Al-Aqsa, is holy for all of us, for all the Ummah. So under that circumstances, these are calls, uh, these are times that call for us to be measured in how we act, in what we do, but also firm. And if you want to help and you don't know how to help, approach your imam, approach your teacher if you're a student, approach your coach. What is it that I can do? Approach us. Hey, I want to do more. And believe me, there are things that you will be able to do if you reach out and you really want to help. Right? I'm not going to take more of your time other than encouraging all of you to be aware in these dangerous times of your surroundings that if you receive any kind of threat or are victim of any kind of crime, hate crime or no hate crime, if you're a victim of any kind of crime, the first thing you do is you call the police and report it. After that, you call care, you wish, or call an attorney. But it's very important, especially in these days, that we report any kind of crimes that affect us or any of the members of our family. We need to keep a record straight so that law enforcement is aware that we don't want to take care of ourselves and we will deposit on you the obligation to take care of us when we report a crime. We always need in care you to first report a crime so that we can go and follow up on that report so that your claim is treated with decency and respect as they treat any other claims that they bring to their attention to law enforcement. So thank you for your attention. Remember, contact your leadership. Maintain contact with the mosque. This will be a center of prayer. It has been and will continue to be, inshallah, a center of prayer for those of our Ummah who are victimized in Gaza and in the rest of the world. So that spiritual connection of prayer, identifying when we see these types of wrongs going on, we need to come here to the house of Allah. This is first. This is where we gain our strength to go back to the street and protest. This is where we gain our strength for Allah to give us words of wisdom so we can speak and educate people Instead of taking 10, 15 minutes with the journalists who come to interview us, you know, I'm taking an average of an hour and 10 minutes with each journalist that come to interview us. For just one minute and a half of report that you see, I've been trying to educate every reporter that comes and want to do a quick question. I tell them from the beginning, I don't have time for a quick question. I do have more time
to educate you on what is it that we want to represent and who is it that I want to speak for that is really the people of Palestine in the, in the West Bank, the people of Palestine in Gaza that have no voice. We are no spokesperson for any kind of organization. We are a spokesperson for that mother, for that brother, for that plumber, for that electrician, for that teacher, for that nurse that lives in Gaza. Those are the people we want to be the voice for. So when you speak about this problem and you want to address about what's happening in Gaza, make sure you make clear I'm speaking for the Palestinians who live in Gaza. I'm no spokesman for nothing else. So, Salam alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you. Thank you for your attention. Call us if you need anything, inshallah. Make you ask for all of us, inshallah. May Allah keep our children of Gaza safe. May Allah keep our mothers of Gaza safe. May Allah keep Allah safe, inshallah. Salam alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Brother Wilfredo, inshallah. So we'll make some dua, inshallah. And if anyone has any questions after the remaining Sunday, you can come and ask myself or Brother Wilfredo, inshallah. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Alhamdulillah. Allahumma rabbana atina fi dunya hasana wa fil akhirati hasana wa qina adab al nar. اللهم انصر المستضعفين في كل مكان اللهم اشف مرضانا ومرض المسلمين وعاف مبتلانا وارحم موتانا وارحم موتانا وارحم موتانا انك على كل شيء قدير اللهم اهدنا في من هديت وعافنا في من عافيت وتولنا في من توليت وبارك لنا فيما اعطيت وقنا واصرف عنا برحمتك شر ما قضيت فإنك تقضي ولا يقضى عليك إنه لا يذل من واليت ولا يعز من عاديت تباركت ربنا وتعاليت فلك الحمد على ما قضيت نستغفرك اللهم من جميع الذنوب والخطايا ونتوب إليك ونتوب إليك Oh Allah, please forgive all our sins يا رب العالمين يا رب العالمين Help us. We come to you praising you, sending salutation upon your Prophet. And we come to you also with broken hearts, with feelings of helplessness. We don't come to you with a lot of the truth of Abu Bakr as Siddiq. We don't come to you with a lot of justice like Umar bin Khattab. We don't come to you with the courage of Ali ibn Abi Talib, the strategy of Khalid bin Wali. The modesty of Uthman ibn Affan. Nor any of our guiding stars, who you said you were all ple- you're pleased with all of them. But Ya Allah, we do come to you with broken hearts, with tears in our eyes. The Prophet says there is no eye that's more valuable than that one that cries out of remembrance of you, out of fear of you. Ya Rabbi, we come to you with these heavy hearts, with these swelling eyes, and with these broken thoughts of confusion, of paranoia, of Heartbreak. We clearly can't put in you words, Ya Rabbi. 
Give us our mercy because you're merciful, not because we deserve it, Ya Rabbi. Ya Rabbi, you lose nothing giving us your help, giving us your mercy, giving us your rahmah, despite the fact that we're as sinful as we are. Ya Rabbi, we don't justify our sins today. We only acknowledge, Ya Rabbi. Ya Rabbi, we only say sorry. We only say astaghfirullah, nothing else. Ya Rabbi, nothing other than just pure apology, Ya Rabbi. Ya Rabbi, there's a lot of those children that we see that are in the conditions that they are. Ya Allah, Ya Allah. Bring mercy to them, Ya Rabbi. Let those who are still suffering, Ya Rabbi, there's those who are still whimpering, let those who are still cold, those who are still burning, and those who are still without loved ones and don't know where they are. Let their hearts get some sort of ease, Ya Rabbi. Comfort them with your divine sukoon, rahmah, tranquility, Ya Rabbi. Give them strength, give them courage, Ya Rabbi. They've shown so much resilience. They've stood in your masjid. Your Masjid Al-Aqsa, they stood despite what they threw at them. Ya Rabbi, Ya Rabbi, give them victory. Ya Allah, let them get out of that jail, Ya Rabbi. Ya Allah, Ya Allah, if Hidayah is not meant for any of those tyrants, Ya Rabbi, take care of them. Ya Rabbi, if guidance is not meant for them, Ya Rabbi, guide them to Islam. Give them the ability to change their life and become better. Ya Rabbi, if that's not meant, Ya Rabbi, you stop them like you've stopped the tyrants of the past. Ya Rabbi, it doesn't take a lot for you. All it takes is one kun, Ya Rabbi. We beg you for that one kun fayakun, Ya Rabbi. That one kun fayakun, we don't know what it looks like, Ya Rabbi, only you know. Like no one knew how you were going to destroy those elephants at the time of Abdul Muttalib, Ya Rabbi. We don't know what you're going to use to destroy all those terrible things that they've deployed against us. Ya Rabbi, whatever it is, Ya Rabbi, we beg you for it. Whatever the faraj, whatever opening there is, Ya Rabbi, we beg for it. Whatever khayr there is, whatever goodness there is, we desperately beg you for it, Ya Rabbi. Desperately beg you for it, Ya Rabbi. Oh Allah, please accept our dua, Ya Rabbi. Oh Allah, please heal our hearts, Ya Rabbi. Heal our Gaza, heal our children, heal our Philistine, that whole Ard al-Sham, our Afghanistan, who all those innocent people who died in that earthquake. Ya Rabbi, make it easy for them and their loved ones and those who are recovering from amongst them. Ya Rabbi, all these places where innocent souls are suffering, Ya Rabbi, you bring ease to them, Ya Rabbi. All of the Ummah Muhammad Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, wherever they are, you know, whatever condition they are, whatever dark place they are, whatever electricity they're cut out from, whatever water. Let them be quenched their thirst. Some mothers are crying that their children are dying hungry, Ya Rabbi. And we're out here wasting food. <laughs> Ya Rabbi, they're dying thirsty. They're dying with electricity. And we're out here complaining about our inconveniences. Ya Rabbi, make us grateful servants to you. Ya Allah, Ya Allah. Anta Rabbul Mustamafin. You're the Lord of all the weak and the oppressed. With your might, with your power, there's nothing, there's nothing that we can't hope for, Ya Rabbi. And your Prophet ﷺ taught us to hope for nothing but the best from you, Ya Rabbi. You yourself teach us, Ya Rabbi. Ana inda lanni abdi bi. I will treat my servants according to what they think of me. Ya Rabbi, here we all are, all of your servants, regardless of where, whether we're from Palestine or not. We do share the kalima your Nabi taught us, La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. That's all we have in common. 
All of us here, your servants, we're begging you, Ya Rabbi. We're begging you, Ya Rabbi. Please have mercy upon us and the people of Philistine and the people of Gaza and the people of the Ummah of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. O Allah, All of those who have specific wants, there's so much devastation, so many people have specific wants, so many people have different problems, different people from their families missing, different loved ones who have lost homes, limbs, everything for your sake. Ya Rabbi, heal their hearts. Inna al-qulub bayna ismail rahman Your Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam taught us that Hearts are entirely in your control. All those hearts that are breaking and hurting in absolute pain, Ya Rabbi. You mend them, Ya Rabbi. You soothe them with your divine tranquility and sakina, Ya Rabbi. Give us the strength to return back to the sunnah, the tradition of your Prophet Muhammad Give us the ability to be proud of our religion, not to be embarrassed of our religion, Ya Rabbi. Ya Rabbi, let this be an epiphany and a wake-up call for all of the Muslimin from amongst the Ummah of the Muhammad of Muhammad Rasulullah to wake up from their slumber, from their oblivion, from their ghafla, and to actually start doing good. Ya Rabbi, we've been distracted by the delusions of this temporary world. It's so shiny that it's taken us away from you. Ya Rabbi, let this be our wake-up call. Let us be from amongst those people who not only control money and oil, but we control our nafs and we control our ego. So that the ummah of Rasulullah can look at another ummah and actually help when they're oppressed. Get us back to the mindset of our noble ancestors. Sirat al ladina an'amta alayhim. Qayr al maghdubi alayhim wal الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين إهمنا الصلاة المستقيم صلاة الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الطالبين آمين اللهم إنا نسألك من خير ما سألك منه نبيك محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم Oh Allah, all those people who are organizing any kind of efforts to help out, to aid, accept all of their efforts, Ya Rabbi. Give us the ability to collectively use whatever talents you've blessed us with to contribute towards helping the Ummah of Rasulullah And accept it from us, Ya Rabbi, because no matter what we try to do, we're human and it's going to be broken. Ya Rabbi, you complete it, you accept it. And Ya Rabbi, you aid all those who are trying to aid your creation. اللهم إنا نسألك من خير ما سألك منه نبيك محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم ونعوذ بك من شر ما استعاد منه نبيك محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وأنت المستعان وعليك البلاغ ولا حول ولا قوة إلا بك أو الله give us the ability to pray in Masjid Al-Aqsa Oh Allah please give us the ability to pray in Masjid Al-Aqsa يا ربي protect it يا ربي and keep us from amongst those who are Destined to pray in it without anyone getting in our way. Ya Rabbi, give us the ability to walk into Masjid Al-Aqsa with pride in you, Ya Rabbi. Not with frustration that why is this person standing here with weapons and not letting me go to your Masjid. Ya Rabbi, give us the ability to go to Masjid Al-Aqsa with that much honor and pride. اللهم إنا نسألك من خير ما سألك من نبيك محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم ونعوذ بك من شر ما استعاد من نبيك محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وأنت المستعان وعليك البلاغ ولا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم